Okay, for the next session, um, which is the final one before we break for morning tea, um, I'd like to invite um, Matt Schaefer up uh, and Leanne Monks will be, uh, will be coming down the, the pipe. So Matt and Leanne are going to explore uh, the role of Datagene uh, in this process and what Datagene is an industry-owned um, animal improvement organisation uh, has to offer here. Uh, Matt uh, will be well known to basically every person in this room, I suspect, um, but just um, to, um, to give the Matt story briefly, uh, Matt comes from uh, Pennsylvania originally, um, grew up uh, milking cows, uh, went to both Penn State and Cambridge for his education, um, working through the Hancock um, Ag Group as one, in one of his first roles, he and his family ended up in Australia, and thankfully for us they decided to stay here. Um, also thankfully he um, ended up in Melbourne and not ended up in Brisbane where he could have ended up. Uh, in the early 2000s, Matt became CEO of Holstein Australia. He was there for seven years. Uh, and at one point there, he was the president of World Holstein for uh, four years. Uh, then in 2013, um, he went to work for DA. He was the program manager for genetics and data management there. And then from DA uh, in 2016, he became the inaugural um, uh, CEO of Datagene when it was first um, came came to uh, to fruition um, and replaced ADHIS. Um, all of you know what Datagene does. I don't think I need to um, explain that to you. Um, but the final bit of the puzzle is that um, Matt's on the Interbull Steering Committee, and he was made chairman in 2019, presumably for your sins, Matt. Is that the story? <laughs> when the music stops. Go for the chair. Uh, Leanne Marks will also be really well known, I think, to uh, many of you. Leanne has worked in pharma communications her entire career, which I think spans a little bit north of um, uh, 25 to 30 years. Uh, based in Queensland now, but she was originally a dairy extension officer based in Bridport in, in Tassie. That's where she started off. Um, she has been circling around and assisting both research development and extension programs uh, for as long as I've known her, which is um, 20 years plus. Uh, and she's a fantastic uh, resource for the dairy industry, uh, full stop. So um, I'd like to welcome Matt and uh, Leanne coming to us live there shortly. Thanks, Matt. Thanks very much, John. Much appreciated. Um, and yes, for my sins, I also get to stand here and stand between you and the morning tea that's coming out. Good morning, Leanne. I suspect you're a bit warmer than we are this morning. It's really wet here. Yes, I was hearing you had a lot of rain. Um, so we'll move relatively quickly through the presentation today, and Leanne and I will um, tag team a little bit. When we started speaking about this, and, and John it triggered a thought too, when you talked about the journey we've been on with genomics, and we're all on different journeys through, through the industry. And how many of you in the room, because I can't see those of you online, how many in the room are parents? How many of you have gone on a long drive with your children, or a long walk with your children? How many of you have heard the phrase, are we there yet? And how many of you in that context understood why spiders eat their young? <laughs> so when Leanne and I talked about this, um, I wanted to bring up a, a, a slide that um, Leanne and I went for a bit of a walk in my first uh, exodus out of uh, Victoria in COVID uh, times. So this was March of last year, I think, Leanne, and we were doing a bit of a hike talking about all things genomics and, and data. And, um, and I, at one point, Leanne, we, I think we looked around and went, oh my God, we're not there yet. And suddenly realized that we are still our children inside. We ask these same questions. And so part of this journey that we have with you here in the room as stakeholders, we all are asking, are we there yet? And the answer is, no, we're not. And it still takes time. There's still things to improve, and that's the process that we're on. Um, and excuse the COVID haircut in that picture, um, and this COVID haircut too. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some service stats, and then I'll hand over to Leanne to talk to you about um, accelerating genomics. And that's no wonder I can't see anybody in the audience. Oh, there are people. Amazing. Getting old. Right. So, 
One of the most exciting things I think in my time within um, DataGene has been the decreasing time it takes us to generate a breeding value for you and your clients. So when we, and this is only from January, June 2020, on the left hand side, we're about 25 days. And by the time we, this is the last measured, was in um, mid-November of last year, we're down to about six point something. So the time it takes to get information to your clients has reduced rapidly. And we heard that from um, John O'Sullivan in the earlier days, just trying to say, well, you, I want the results before my, my cows are weaned. So we made big progress. Part of that um, is driven by the number of deliveries of breeding values we do. So these bars represent the number of breeding value runs we did in 2016 when DataGene was set up. We now do this many. This is what we're doing this year. So we've effectively moved to almost weekly runs. We do have gaps for various reasons through the year to do maintenance and do checking and QA, but effectively the team runs that machine nonstop. So what have we seen in terms of the growth of testing? So back in 2013, 2014, we did under 500 female tests. Last year, we did um, over 40,000. And, and this year to date, we're at about 40,000. And, and that was at the end of January. So we're just over halfway. So we have a target, and, and others will talk about that, of hitting 300,000 heifers tested a year. And we're on our way there. Uh, it's a big, aggressive target, but one that we hope to meet uh, with all of you in the room. Not to forget the bulls. We've seen a tremendous increase over the same time period in the bulls tested from just over 500, uh, 55, sorry, I'm getting old enough, I can't even read that one, um, 555 back in uh, 12 and 13 to almost 5,000 last year. And we were on target to do roughly the same this year. And that's for a country that has one point. Four million milking cows. That's a pretty good effort for a country of our size. And it's you know, a note, uh, a note of appreciation for those in the room who help keep that number going to find those bulls that suit our climate here. Another point of interest may be the number of cows in, in the central data repository. So last year they grew basically by a million. And um, I will suspect, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, that we'll start to see that uh, creep up a bit more in the future as we connect more data sources into that. So what are some of the service improvements we've done? And I'll touch on a few, and a few get touched on throughout the, the rest of the day. One that Tui will talk about later in the day is Aussie Red Genomics, um, or Red Breed Genomics, as it ended up being. And um, I won't spend much time on that, but that's been a tremendous amount of work by, um, by the team, and particularly Dairy Bio and Hurt and Tui's teams to get that rolled out. Calving Ease Genomics, we didn't have that until just recently. It's all been part of um, the journey that we've been on. And I stole this from you, Michelle, this Who Is Your Daddy? Um, automating parentage discovery and, and correction. That's been a big step. The ability for genomic service providers to create national IDs for unknown animals so that we don't have some of the, the um, lag time that we used to have. All these things are driving that turnaround time to reduce it. Daily loading of information to make sure we get information coming out of the herd test centers into our system so there's no backlog there. Improved troubleshooting for both you as clients and your clients, but also ourselves internally, including improved you know, inconsistency reports. And we look at a lot at the metrics of how we measure our service and how many animals fall out. And this is driven in conjunction with the work that we've done with Air Australia. So it's been quite an effort as, as an industry to get to this stage. So one of the things um, that I'll now hand over to Leanne to talk about, uh, and then speaking of DA, was a group, a uh, body of work that we're doing with DA called Accelerating Genomics. So I'll turn over to Leanne. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Okay. Um, well, I thought we would start with a quiz to wake you all up a bit. And hopefully, Matt, you can put up on the screen um, how people can get onto that from their phones. So how do they actually scan that code? Can they scan it from a distance? They can also scan it from the back of their cards because it's also the survey card. So it's the same as on the back of your tag. 
So there's five quick questions and um, it should only take a minute. So I will set my timer for a minute. Can we have a bit of feedback as to whether it's working? <laughs> People are getting there. Yep, I've got some thumbs. And cracked fingers as far as I can tell. I'm assuming those were thumbs. And Leanne, this always makes me nervous, this new technology stuff. I can remember the first time we had QR codes and I went, what is that? And now they're <laughs> every day. Making progress, anybody having any issues? No, all done. So can we have some thumbs up if people are finished? We've still got a little bit of time, I think, we am. We better not rush them too much. Okay, well, you, you give me the feedback of when you think people look like they're ready. No worries. Yeah, that is all checking emails, I'm not sure which. No, my survey's far more interesting. <laughs> it's a problem being before a morning tea. Why we've got everybody in madly tapping, just a quick thank you to the team for putting today together. Um, it's been an amazing effort and I know how much work goes in. It's great to stand up here. I was saying to somebody earlier this morning, first time I've been in an event like this since Herd 21 last year, almost this time. So it's good to uh, see people. And to be honest, it's good to be out of the house and out of the suburb. So, right, I reckon Leanne, yeah, cool. it's only five questions. So if the AV guys could um, display the responses to the first one, when did sex semen first start? So I can't see that. Yep. So you'll have to tell me if, it, if it's up there and what it looks like. Not quite yet, Leanne. Okay, cool. Ah, now I can see Now it, it is. Okay, so I wondered, um, Adam Daniel, if he's in the room, if he could tell us the answer. Adam? So I didn't hear any of that, but I'll assume that um, <laughs> that he, he, he gave us the answer and we're all good. Um, 1970s was his response, Leanne. We'll need to remember to bring the mic. Actually, why don't I take the mic and I can wander around and you'll do it? Fine. Cool. Okay, cool. So actually, Pete Williams tells me it was 1984, but it was a long time ago. Um, if we could see the responses to the second um, question, please. What year was sex semen first sold in oh. Australia? And Brad Atkin, can you tell us the answer to that one, please? Brad, where are you? He's not actually in the room, Leanne. Oh, he's not actually in the room. Okay, Pete Williams, can you, can you help us out there? You have to speak in the mic, please, Pete. Sorry, Adam. 2004, Leanne. Yes, that's right. So it took a long time between... Um, the research and when it was first sold. And question three, the initial barriers to adoption. <laughs> Is Paul Douglas in the room? I have not seen Paul, so no, he's, okay. he's not. Anyway, um, I think Pete Williams, you would agree that um, the big ones there would um, be what your experience was? So I'm not, I'm, 
uh, we're having an issue with the roving mic, Leanne, so apologies about that. You, that was a fascinating conversation between the two gentlemen. Um, we, we might continue on. <laughs> okay. In fact, what I'll do is I'll get Pete to come up and stand beside you because I want him to talk about the next one yeah. as well, which was what things contributed to the increase in use of sex semen in the past five years. And that's unlike you, Leanne, to push me off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we, um, I guess it, it's, if you look at the adoption of sex semen, uh, it really took off from about 2015, 16. A um, couple of things that really drove it was a huge development with sex doltra. So that was the processing, the means by which it's processed. Uh, the accuracy, so the determination, the number of female, um, so the increased accuracy, uh, the availability of bulls, and also the uh, the price. So um, a lot of things added, and sex sell um, was another option as well. Which all contributed to those conception rates. Yes, and farmers' confidence now that when they use it, it's not just an investment to nowhere. It, it they, they know how it works, and they're using it really well now. And the last question was, do you consider sex semen to be routine practice on most dairy farms now? And Pete, you and I got a sneak preview of the latest um, NHIA survey results. So we've got about 50-50 split there in the responses. Um, what do you reckon, Pete? Yeah, I, I, um, I voted with the top one. I, I think it's, it's on its way. So it's, it's, as Matt said, it's momentum now. And the people using it are continuing to use it. So they're not using it for a year, dropping it. Um, it's certainly something. And, you know, the experience from overseas, John indicated now, it's a huge part of what he does in Ireland. So I think we're going to find different ways of using it and that will incorporate beef as well. And the latest results show about... 20% of straws last year were sexed. And when you consider that um, you would, nobody would put all their straws in as sex, that, that's a pretty good indication of, of widespread use. Thanks, Pete. Can I have the next slide, please? Off you go, Leanne. So, yep, so we've seen that the sex semen journey took decades from concept through to uh, widespread um, use on farm routine practice. Um, and the next slide, Matt. So we wonder then what the genomics journey timeframe might be like. And um, I want to talk to you today about a few initiatives to try and speed up that timeline. Next one. Um, Matt's already told you that um, the stats show that bull uh, genomics was really quickly adopted in Australia. And the next slide. But it's a different story when it comes to females. In 2019, about 4% of Australian herd recorded cows had been genotyped compared to 22% in the US. And the next slide. So that then led us to um, Dairy Australia and Data Gene setting up the Genomic Acceleration Project, which has the ambitious goal of genomic testing to be routine on most dairy farms by 2025. That's equivalent to testing 300 calves per year um, and that is a long way from the 23,000 that were tested in 2020. Next slide. So to, um, to help accelerate the process, Dairy Australia and Data Gene uh, put together a three-pronged approach. The first was investment in um, IT and process um, changes to cut the turnaround time for farmers to receive their results. And Matt's shown you some of the um, outcomes from that. We also explored opportunities to work with genomic service providers and others in the non-competitive space, and we developed communication and extension activities to improve the understanding of the value of genomics. Today, I want to talk to you quickly about some of the work we did to inform the design of the communication and extension activities. We know that genomics is underpinned by robust science and that the economics stack up. What we wanted to better understand is what else influences farmers' decisions about whether to test their heifers or not. So we set up um, a series of farmer interviews um, and we also talked to some genomic service providers. Our topics were informed by the feedback from the genomic service providers um, and we did detailed interviews with two of you. The next slide. Um, our interview topics were slightly modified according to each of the farmers' level of interest in genomics, which we loosely described as genomics convert, 
genomics is on my radar and a non-convert. And a quick look at the findings. Um, the initial attraction of genomics were fairly consistent across all of the farmers that we interviewed. The two biggest were parentage verification and to be able to identify heifers to keep as replacements. But as they gained experience, the converts also used the results for breeding decisions and business decisions. For example, using sex semen over high genetic merit females and beef over the bottom. This allowed them to develop new income streams by sell selling dairy beef calves for surplus heifers. So the next slide. All the farmers we interviewed who had not tested had heard of genomics. So awareness was really high, but their understanding was limited in terms of the logistics of sampling, the cost involved, local services, and how to use the results to make decisions and its value to the business. And this was really, really powerful in, in helping us focus the development of the extension activities to, to a, perhaps um, a more basic level than, than we might have gone in with otherwise. Um, and one of their farmer interview quotes was, you know, nobody wants to look silly and admit they don't know about genomics because everyone's heard of it. So we, we took that in mind. The barriers cited by those who hadn't tested fell into the theme, following themes. The herd or the business wasn't yet ready for genomics. The sampling logistics were overwhelming the costs were prohibitive, they weren't competent in the technology, or there were just other priorities for the business. The converts said those barriers fell away once they started using the results. For example, their focus changed from the cost of testing to the value of genomics. So based on, on what we heard, we developed an adoption pathway um, right from awareness and understanding through to considering and overcoming the barriers, deciding and sampling and return interpreting the results. We wanted to actually support farmers through this whole process. So next slide. In May and September last year, we ran um, awareness programs, which was when seasonal curds had calves in the shed. And the awareness activities directed people to web resources, including videos, testimonials, podcasts, and practical information like operating procedures and lists of local service providers. Next slide. We're now in the process of um, de developing and delivering some extension activities. Each is designed for people at different points in that adoption pathway. Kirsten will talk about them in a bit more detail later today. But just to give you a, a, a quick introduction, genomics at a glance introduces the basics of genomics and allows lots of time for discussion. We offered it um, online and face-to-face, -face, but most importantly, there are two guest speakers, a genomics specialist and a farmer with genomics experience. Genomics in practice is, um, is, a, is held on farm and it's in an interactive format demonstrating the tissue sample sampling process and looking up the results and the host farmer shares how the, the, the genomic results have influenced their decisions. And then Genomics in Action is a virtual discussion group for farmers who are already testing and want to get more value from their results. And I can't remember which speaker it was this morning, or maybe it was a couple who said, you know, the last thing they want to do is have farmers test once, use it for culling decisions and never use the results again, because there's so much more to get out of genomics than just that. In those online um, virtual discussion um, groups and actually all of those um, extension activities, um, people running them will have access to um, specialists like Pete Dern and Pete Williams as, as guest speakers. Next slide, collaboration. So we are serious about getting you involved. Collaboration is absolutely key along that whole adoption pathway. We need each other to reach enough farmers to make our target of 300,000 um, tests per year. So um, really like to sow the seed for those of you in the audience about to think about whether you might like to run one of those um, extension activities uh, for your organisation with, with support from Dairy Australia and Data Gene. So back over to you, Matt. Thanks, Leanne. And John, I'm just um, eyeing off the food in the back, and I know we're running a bit late, so I will very quickly go through a few slides. Um, we've talked a little bit about Datavat this morning, um, but we've got two experts in the room on Datavat in the two Pete's, um, and I've stolen a few of um, Pete Thurn slides, uh, so we'll, we'll use a few of these now as we um, go through. So Datavat's a portal that 
farmers can access and service providers can access. So I won't go into much more but one new thing that's arrived and um, Nick out in WA has already rolled this out to his farmers is something called Herd Platform. And Herd Platform um, takes information from herd testing and makes it available to farmers and their advisors in, in new and, and different ways. So some of you may remember a few years ago the creation of a um, uh, herd test dashboard that had various uh, indicators and gave some advice on what you could do about various indicators and some, some stats. This is now made electronic, which when we sat down around a table in 2014, that's what we wanted it to be, but it took us a little while to get the technology there. So this is an interactive tool. Um, it's, it's basically live. When the herd test happens and gets loaded on the system, this is also activated. So you can see various graphs, you can see various stats, and Pete would do a much better job of presenting this than I will, so apologies, Pete. Um, you can give me a serve later for my poor job on it. Um, but you can look at the performance over years, by month and by cows. You can look at um, individual animals within the herd. You can look, search for individual animals. You can also then copy, print, um, or export into various other formats and you can uh, drill down into that individual animal by looking at the animal details page. So this is all linked and interactive. When you go down to the summary, again, if you remember the printed report, this was on the back side of the first page, and it was some target animals that had issues, red um, being not a great color to have, um, and green being a bit better. And this is an interactive one, providing glossary supporting and dashboard metrics, so they can tell you what it actually means. You can, again, copy, print, or export. And you can also um, sort to rank cows if you want to only the ones that have a, a, a problem identified. And again, the cow IDs are linked so you can go back to the main page. So there are also, this becomes a platform to delivery of new tools and two that I'll just flag uh, um, as coming and they're in test now are two uh, that we've developed in conjunction with Dairy Australia, particularly John. I remember hearing you speak about this, John, a couple of years ago in Canberra at a conference. Um, so we've turned it into reality here and a lot of work from Steph and, and our team on that. And Mere Conception, uh, which enables farmers to uh, have a percentage, uh, uh, sorry, let me get the wording right, Michelle, I'll try to get the wording right. Um, it, it enables farmers to have a view of uh, the likelihood of pregnancy to first uh, insemination. So that's also in test and that's quite an exciting tool that will be available here. Also, quick links to other tools that we've had for some time, fertility focus, mastitis focus, etc. So I'll just do a quick um, preview of genomic genetics futures. So this was developed a few years ago. Um, some of you may use it. If you don't use it and would like some help on understanding it, um, the two Pete's are here to, to, to help you with that. But it shows what the farm may do in the future based on a variety of bulls, um, bull teams that they look at. Another exciting thing that we've worked on with Dairy Australia is the forage value index. Um, genetics is genetics, whether they're cows, pigs, grass, peaches, um, doesn't really matter. So uh, in conjunction with Dairy Australia and Dairy Feedbase, we've cr started creating the uh, forage value index for them. So that's uh, due to come out in the, in the near future, I think, um, the, the, this year's version of it. We talked a bit about data and we talked about some of the information coming into the, into the system. IDEDA is an international collaborative effort that we've been involved in for some time. And this is another one of those long journeys where you look at where you're going, where you've come from, and it seems like you're not getting anywhere, but we finally are. This allows us to transfer data between on-farm systems, whether that be a, a shed system um, or uh, uh, on-farm software of some sort, back through into the databases and repopulate things. So that's up and going. Um, the, f the first few cabs are Guilla, De Laval, and um, Lely. So that data is flowing now, and we would expect to hook up to this international consortium in this calendar year. So um, that's a big step change for us, and that includes things like um, activity meters, et cetera. So it's a new source of data that we then enable others in the industry to potentially use as well. So I'll stop there. Tui talks on some of the other improvements a bit later. And Leanne, you've been busy at work on some other genomic resources. Uh, yep, so just very quickly, um, you can access genomic resources from either the Dairy Australia website or the Data Gene website. Probably the quickest thing to do is to go to the Data Gene homepage and click on that heifer genomics button that I've put the red circle around. 
Um, and then if you just go to the next slide, once you click on that button, you'll get to lots and lots of, um, you'll get to a heifer genomics page with lots of resources, including videos, podcasts, fact sheets, tech notes, webinars, case studies. We've tried to provide lots of different formats for um, different learning preferences. Um, and you're welcome to use any of these in any way that helps you. Um, and then I just thought I'd highlight some um, a couple of things that are helpful for getting customers started. So there's a standard operating procedure for um, taking samples and there's also a video on how to take a sample. Well, thank you. That concludes our discussion. Um, I think, Leanne, from, from our point of view, it's been a great journey working with people in this room to um, work through some of the challenges, understand challenges from your point of view of service delivery. How do we help you to help your clients? Um, it's been a, a fantastic cooperation with Dairy Australia as we generate new material and start to lift the um, industry level noise about genomics and the importance of that. So. Uh, a big thank you to all of you in the, in the audience and online today. Uh, we appreciate your help and uh, we look forward to continuing this journey with you. John, I'm sorry we are a little bit over, um, but I, according to my timer, I'm a minute early. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Folks, can you please uh, join me in, in uh, thanking Leanne and Matt?